Michael Klinsky was he's, on he's even he's more. Well, no, 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 no. Oh. You, you, Masuki was on once. Yeah. With uh, Sue and was it Kelly? Kelly? And Kelly. Was Amy there? No, I don't think Amy was that that one. It was like I think it was just like the might have been the four of you. Should have been. Well, you know, the thing is when you're doing a po- you know, an audio thing, you don't want like 10 people yeah. on it if you cannot avoid just it cuz four. four is about the It's top. that's even too many, but yeah. but that it was fine cuz we were promoting the uh Brooklyn Reconstruct series. The gentrification just, forum. I just the more I, you know, I've been trying to not think really truthfully about that so all well. that it all that is um just ignore it. The all that is um Inevitable about what's gone on this week, and I'm just, but I'm just blocking it for the moment because I can't. But every so, it's just a little bit like will creep in like another thing that is a result of that. Like just uh, yet another. Oh, there's so many hundreds and hundreds of horrible potential results of this. Uh, this what's going on. So I just, and I'm trying not to deal with it right now. I'm, I'm trying to also, push it away. There really is um, a spirit Hold it closer. of yeah of collective action. In some way of people saying, I know maybe we haven't been on the same page about some of the stuff that's going on, and some of us haven't been as active as we really should have been. We've been more observers rather than participants. And I do believe that um, ugly things are going to take place over the next couple of years. But in that tumult, Mm -hmm. hopefully, we will have uh, some very positive changes. That people will feel like they want to differentiate themselves from that. You know, that we are not that, and now that's there. Uh-huh. And it's like maybe he gets rid of all the, let you know, um, when, okay. yeah. and, and Well, this is, uh, okay. I mean, oh. just because I was walking over, I just remembered. Not that I ever really forgot it, but I had not been thinking about it. I've been really making an act of, like, just to shut down, which is not typical, but I was thinking, I remember. He doesn't believe in global warming, for instance. And then I was also thinking, they set it up so perfectly, there's nothing we can do because we have to keep Donald Trump as the president because if we don't, then Mike Pence will be the president. And he's uh, even worse, if possible, on a whole other level. But he's actually... And in a way, we you know we can only assume that he'll be making the big decisions anyway. I don't know, like the Cheney kind of relationship. Mm. But anyway, I, I can't, I can't, I get mm. to spray down about it. And you guys have a, a, a really upbeat film. It's a lot of laughs. There's musical numbers in it. This, well, no, you do have the true. best. You do have and the best. You actually have the only documentary that I've ever seen that has in its cast or among its subjects. You have Howard Stern and Larry David, so it's got to be him. And Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders, right. And Dr. Sarnow. Sarnow, who's a, who's a comedian himself. <laughs> funny, actually. Yeah, I bet he is. He can be. Very wry, I assume. Good word. Uh-huh. And he doesn't sound, he, he sounds, it doesn't seem like he really wants to show that off either. He's not like, right. it's just something that gets inserted from time. Because you don't, see, you know, he, he's very unassuming looking, very right. well, sh- small. I, I I, I mean, think stature, stature. In some ways, stature. we should step backwards yeah, just a couple of steps because absolutely. nobody knows what we're talking about. That's very true, although I will have done an intro, which okay. will explain the film in, an, in a nutshell. But we, we should yeah, step Yeah, but I'm back. out on a limb. I walked in 15 minutes <laughs> late to the movie. I don't know what we're talking about. Oh, I thought you were going to say to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> in this conversation because we didn't see the opening. Any, anyway, um, so what, maybe tell yeah. us what the opening is so that I'll know what I have to explain. Why don't you provide? What do you, oh. Oh, I see what you're saying. The no, no. It's, well, the, the well, I'll start off, and you you in, interrupt me because. Okay. I'm but, not gonna interrupt. But I remember, I remember seeing footage that you sent me years ago mm-hmm. when Battle for Brooklyn was out, or you know, in the uh, circuit, mm-hmm. and audiences were finding it. There were lots of great events and and um, screenings around Battle for Brooklyn. But I remember you were already uh, well on your way with this other story that you're trying to get off the ground a couple of times. Right. And you were going through periodical times of, of great suffering and pain with your own back. And that might have been a better title. Times of great suffering. <laughs> Although actually all the rage all I was kind of curious about good that. right now actually. Sure. Well, so the movie in a nutshell is about largely about a doctor named Dr. John Sarno who wrote a book called Healing Back Pain. Mm-hmm. And he wrote it because he came to the understanding that the great pain epidemic that we were beginning in the uh, mid to early 70s was actually a psychosomatically created illness rather than a structural problem. And he thought that the problem was repressed 
rage, mm-hmm. oftentimes rage from childhood. Mm-hmm. And um, of course, all of his peers thought he was wacko. They just, they just completely dismissed him out of hand, yet he had incredible success in treating patients. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting now is in the last couple of days, because we're having this conversation a couple of days after the great unawakening of mm-hmm. America, right. um, in which there have been lots of articles including in science magazines, et cetera, saying that the reason Donald Trump won was because of the power of rage to basically disorient people. And he basically pulls up all this rage. And you, when you are in a rage, you literally cannot think straight. Mm-hmm. It's almost like having a concussion. And so it is all the rage that won the election for, for Donald absolutely, Trump. Absolutely. But at the same There's no time, other explanation. Uh, Going back to the idea that Sarno predicted that there would be an epidemic of pain because he did see this as, um, you know, pain being caused by repressed emotions back in the 70s and nobody was listening. And so, therefore, they were not, you know, they were getting the wrong diagnosis. And, and, if you, so, and he, he likened it to in, during the Black Plague. If people simply knew to wash their hands... Mm-hmm. then you would have stopped it immediately. Because if you know what the cause is, you can address it. But if you only treat the symptomology, you're, just, you're going to get an epidemic, mm-hmm. is what he wrote back in the 70s. And he was correct. Because when we started, so to, to roll backwards a little bit more. No, Pete, and do. I, I, but I want to just stay in the 70s for a second because... I want to stay in the 70s for a second. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> uh, that's what the, was the advent of popular talk therapy started, really. In a, in a, in a, there was a way, maybe... The, tail end of the 60s into the 70s is when people started going to therapists at least in mm-hmm. progressive a lot of Jewish households like like my parents generation totally bought in they weren't into the est thing they were about talk therapy and you know I wonder if that didn't actually open a can of worms because if you can just not think about something like I was trying to do most of this week you know at first anyway it kind of works but you're saying is but it then not the cup runneth over after yeah, a while? Yeah, right. The rage will come out. If, it will because it actually takes a lot of a lot of physical and emotional effort to hold it down, to keep hold those it in down. to the and, and pit it's of your stomach. Largely unconscious. That's right. the thing. So these things are all about the unconscious. And so it's, it is interesting though because to roll backwards. Right. So one of the things when he came up with these ideas and he he basically came up with it because he was treating people and all of the standard care didn't work. The bed rest <laughs> and the physical therapy and. Everything Surgery. else that he'd been taught, it didn't, didn't really work. So then he started to look at his patients' charts, and he found that 80% of them had a history of two or more other psychosomatic illnesses, like eczema or colitis or migraines or uh, just other things that were known Eyes. to have a mind-body connection. Yeah. So then he started to talk to his patients, and he realized that most of them were very repressive of certain things. They wouldn't even kind of go there. Like, they wouldn't talk about things that seemed uncomfortable. And when he got them to make the connection that it was possibly created by stress— they started to get better. Mm-hmm. When they stopped being afraid that something was going to be wrong with them forever, mm-hmm. they got better. Mm-hmm. So he continued to develop his theories, and he also went to look at the data that supported bed rest and traction and all this stuff, and he found that there actually wasn't any. It mm-hmm. wasn't supported by scientific studies. It was just standard care that had been done You're for not even time. talking about big pharma. I mean, we're not even talking about well, that. That's a whole got, other layer got, to it. No, you rolled yet. back to, before that. I, I understand. Before that. Right, because so it was like a gift. To, to me. <laughs> he set that up nicely. Yeah. You know, because actually he had a great deal of success, but he was totally ignored. And so uh-huh. he just became cloistered in his institution. But what he predicted happened. So you started to have increased problems. and It, just, it started to spread because it's also a, um, a cultural contagion. So you hear about somebody having this, and mm-hmm. then that's, right. where, that's where... So his theory was that it was a, it was a direct product of the unconscious causing the pain to distract you from uncomfortable emotions. So it provided a way to keep, so in the way right. any other distraction might, like your cell phone might be a distraction sure. until that can't distract you enough anymore, and, and then it, it strikes you down. Um, but what's interesting is my father read the book in the 80s. My, mm-hmm. my father almost died of an ulcer when I was in second grade, mm-hmm. so he would definitely you know, held in his stress. And uh, a couple months after, or a couple months or a couple years, I don't know, because I was in second grade, we were in a fender bender, the whole family. I mean, it was like three miles an hour, and he ended up with whiplash, which plagued him for years. Now, my father was a psychologist, mm-hmm. and when um, someone gave wow. him Dr. Sarno's book a few years later, immediately understood what he was talking about and immediately basically got better. Um, and didn't have those same kind of back pains for a long After time. After the car, the fender bender. Yeah, but it, but it, was an ex- it was in a way an excuse for his physical 
for his uh, emotional... ego or his physical right. uh, physical uh, self to uh, uh, to distract his emotional self. It was I... like this was here's your excuse. You now have a reason to have back pain and neck pain and to suffer physically, so you don't have to deal with right. the emotional because the ulcer didn't work anymore. <laughs> no, no, really. I mean, it's like it will yeah. it will migrate. And what was okay. interesting also Migrates. is that once that the whole culture understood that ulcers were stress related, it yeah. stopped being as effective. And that's when you start to have the pain. Wow. So it, it sounds viral. It's it's it like is, that it you viral. treat a virus, but it learns to mutate. You know what I mean? Literally, exactly. a, a viruses mutate so they can survive. And uh, this is, sounds like almost like a version of that. Right. Sarno calls it the symptom imperative, where uh-huh. you know once you your mind becomes alert to the fact that your el- you know your tennis elbow is doing it because of of some emotional reason, mm-hmm. then it doesn't work anymore, and so it goes oh. to your neck and it goes oh. to your shoulder. It's trying as hard as it can because he started to find that patients would get over one thing and Why? then they would come back with another, or but they if you would know go that, somewhere else. But if you know that you know maybe some sort of some pathology you're you're going through, like a back pain or a neck pain, is indeed a psychological rooted problem, that, and you know that and you deal with it, how can it move? Because you're still, it's not like you it's don't him. become aware of it. But what's the next step that Sarno taught the people so that, that well, here, it can't mutate anymore? So at can't first move. what he did was he would examine patients physically to make sure there was no structural problem like a, a crack in the spine sure. or a tumor right. or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, when, he, when he knew it was just muscular, it was tightness in the muscles. Like you? Like me or, or so many other people. He was able to get people to recognize it. But also, he gave them tools. So the first thing he did is he, he'd examine you. Then he would give you tools to do, such as journaling about what's going on in your life. There's so much data that if we write down our thoughts, we get them out of our head. Really? There's so much data about that. Journaling is the best thing anyone could do. Really? You don't even have to read it again. Just, you just want to it's write it down. the act of doing the act it. act of writing. Not typing either. It's really writing. You have helps. to write it. You have to Why, write it. It's writing therapy. You can Google is it. Is that true? Yeah. Why not typing? It doesn't seem to be as effective. I, maybe reason. it's because the manual aspect of the the, the mental aspect. I don't know. It just yeah. I, I read that the other day. Because it's more it's like more personal. It's actually connected to you, and it comes out through your arm and onto the page, and then it's gone, mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, but so that was the first step. Is like you you read his book, you kind of really mm-hmm. do it. Then you go to his lecture where he really lays it out and gives you lots of scientific data. So, for instance, we were talking about my father and whiplash, right? <laughs> now. Whiplash, there's so much proof that it's a mind-body related issue. In the turn of the century, we had railway spine. When the railroad started, people started getting railway spine, but it was a social contagion, and it eventually disappeared. Um, people, they, they thought that the shaking of the train was messing up their spines. <laughs> we laugh at it now, but probably thousands of people might have been suffering from something, like for, uh, it, needlessly. Right. Well, so it's interesting. These, these guys did this experiment where they, they looked at the rate of whiplash in Lithuania mm-hmm. and in, I think it's Sweden, which is right next door. In Sweden, 30% of the people in a car accident had whiplash. That was debilitating and required like all, all kinds of help. Mm-hmm. In Lithuania, it did not exist. Nobody had whiplash. And if you think about how the mind-body problem works, if you go to a doctor, and a lot of this is sparked by fear, it's, all this is connected to the autonomic nervous system mm-hmm. and the fight-or-flight response. If you go to a doctor and they say, be very careful, you know, you really got to watch your neck, you may have whiplash, and if you have whiplash, it's really bad, and it will last for years. Yeah, yeah, you that know? gets and, in, creeps uh, into, that creeps right. into... It's power suggestion. Yeah. But if they say to you, you know, you may have heard of whiplash, but we really know that that's complete bullshit. And you may, your neck may hurt for a couple of yeah. days, but you're going to be fine. Like that, this sounds like the carpal tunnel phenomenon, right. which was also debunked largely right. uh, because they said that this was also the result of hysteria. Like the, the, the well, whole hysteria. But see, when you use the word hysteria, it makes it seem uh, like everyone's hysterical. But really what it is is all most illness yeah. has a relationship between the mind and the body. And this goes okay. back to this other aspect of the story. So the story is largely about Dr. Sarno. It's also a very personal story because I said like my dad went to see him, then my mm-hmm. brother went to see him and I ended up in his office and that's how we started this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when was that? That was in 2004. Okay. And we started shooting. We weren't able to figure out how to make the story and it kind of went on hold. And then when it happened again in 2011, right. we had to make it. Right, so hysterical is really the wrong idea, but it's really just, it's cultural. Mm-hmm. So these, these things that we have are related to what we I expect see. and what right. we believe. Like one person we didn't interview, but we read her book. It's called Dance of Shadows, and I can't remember the woman's name. Do you, uh, yeah. The Cure Within, actually. Oh, oh, right. The Cure oh. Within. But she basically looked at um, my, the, the history of mind-body medicine, Anne Harrington. Okay. And, and one, of, one aspect of that 
book was about hypnosis. And mm -hmm. what she found as she studied it was that it manifests itself very differently every 10 years. Mm -hmm. So like at the, in the 1870s, and I, I don't have this right, like people walked around with their arms straight out uh, like a zombie. And then 10 years later, it was all like palsy. And then it was speaking in tongues. But it was like what was expected, the unconscious provided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's these, all these strange connections with, with how these things work. And all of these things are cultural. And that goes back to what I was saying is 2004, we tried to start making this movie. Nobody wanted to hear of it. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. You were, we, people were, were enraged if we told them that, you know, your back problem might be psychosomatic. They feel like you're talking down to them, that you're, you're patronizing them. You're blaming them, them or patronizing them. It's, yeah. You're saying this is my head. This isn't, I, I feel this. You're, you're, you. And, they, right. and, and right. we also applied for probably 30 or 40 grants and didn't get any. Wow. Then also we mm -hmm. had been typically making very much um, verite follow docs and we were trying to do that with Dr. Sarno, but he wouldn't introduce us to patients because of, you know, ethical reasons. We yeah. couldn't find anyone to bring to him. He, he published a book at that time, but he didn't do anything. He didn't no have, press. there was nothing, not no press. And there was no media about it except for a 1999 John Stossel piece. And we were trying oh. and, and we also, we felt a lot of respect for him. He's also in him. your documentary. By the way. Uh, yeah. And John Stossel is in the piece, but, uh, it was just very hard. We couldn't figure out how to make it. And we shot six hours of tape. And for us, you know, we shoot six hours of tape a day on some projects over three and a half years. And eventually it just kind of petered out. And we yeah. just were kind of embarrassed and you, for him. And you had another big project that was getting a lot of attention on the other hand. No, we were. we were that some years later? We were working but, on, yeah, this is 2006 that we yeah. kind of put it on hold. And we, that's when we were finishing Code 33. And we were, we were working on Battle for Brooklyn for years. And we were working on that um, Broken Angel movie and all these different things, but we okay. weren't able to figure out how to do it. So when it happened in 2011 again, that's when I was like, we're making this fucking movie. I, literally, when I hit the floor in terrible pain, I screamed that and we you know, grabbed the camera. And so David started shooting, but it was really revelatory when we started it back up because this had been five or so, six years that we hadn't been able to work on it. And in that time, so many other books had come out by doctors, like a gastroenterologist had written, named Dr. Uh, David Clark had written a book called They Can't Find Anything Wrong. 7,000 cases where he slowly had discovered that the mind-body aspect was huge with gut issues. Mm -hmm. And then there was another guy named Gabor Mate who'd written When the Body Says No, or The Body Says No. And he says that if you can't say no, if you're so repressed of your emotions that you don't even realize that you're angry. Like if someone says to you, like for instance, say you have a, like a broken ankle and mm -hmm. you're walking down the street with your crutches and someone says, hey, can you lift up on the back of my car and help me get out of the ditch? You would put down your crutches and try and figure out how to do it rather than say, that's ridiculous. I, what, how can you ask me that? <laughs> because you just, you can't say no. Mm -hmm. um, and these are learned behaviors from childhood. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all about patterns of behavior that you mm -hmm. just are not even aware of. Mm -hmm. And he says it leads to all the autoimmune diseases, and there's a lot of data that shows that. And what's interesting is we also found that people were more open to the idea as well. So it was a completely different process. And what's even more interesting, in the four or five years that we've been working on it since then, I mean, it has exploded in understanding. Like, everybody gets it now. And, like, two weeks ago, I started reading a book called... Um, uh, Keeps the score. The body keeps the score by Bessel van der Kolk. Mm -hmm. we, and these it's names just roll off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> but he, like Gabor Mate, he's the, a child of Holocaust survivors. Okay. And he studied trauma, and he came to understand that. So we're this is going back to that '70s idea. This is when he was starting to, to work in this <laughs> thing. The talk therapy is very can be very useful, but when you have deeply seated trauma, it's actually a very physical process that circumvents the talking cognitive mind. It's, it is a automatic, physical, autonomic reaction, the kind of panic that people mm -hmm. have when they have PTSD. And you can't actually deal with it with talk therapy. You actually have to deal with the trauma itself. And you have to do it through different techniques that actually Hypnosis. activate the autonomic nervous system. Uh, I haven't actually gotten to the part of the book that okay. lays out all the, the cures, okay. but like, you know, like rapid eye movement therapy in which sometimes oh. this releases these things. Certain light, you know, that like they do for depression. Uh, right. So like there's a uh, seasonal depression. Mm -hmm. One way to deal with, uh, treat that is with the special lamps mm -hmm. that seems to work. Mm -hmm. There's, so it's interesting, like it's, there's other ways than talk. We've been for generations right. taught and, and, that talk therapy is, you know, can kind of help you, you know, get yourself out of the psychological weeds. Right. But it's interesting when we're talking about unconscious, mm -hmm. you know, things that are like have their genesis in the unconscious. How could you talk about that if you're not yeah. conscious of it? So 
you could understand why why you'd have to find some other way. But but this goes back to this other idea. So as I was saying, the movie's about Dr. Sarno. It's um, about myself. Right. But it's also just about culture and what is science. And it, we have a, a short kind of animation in it which kind of tracks the history of science, which is really like a kind of the Hegelian dialectic where there's, you know, the kind of the divide between the mind and the body. Mm-hmm. And when we have the most success is when you're in that balanced place between understanding the, the mind and the body. And, when, and so when you had this biotechnical advances like um, antibiotics or vaccines, we had this kind of like it's all science is going to solve this through the body in this almost mechanical way and completely ignored the mind to mm-hmm. the point that you can't even talk about it. And so you did have people dealing with mind issues, but completely disconnected from health. So it was like, oh, you're having emotional problems. Let's deal with those. Mm-hmm. But not even making any connections. So there was, they weren't talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And yet he had started when, you know, understanding about medicine when Freud was still somewhat in vogue. So Dr. Cerner had that understanding, was able to kind of keep that going. And so the movie really becomes about this idea. Like if you look at... Um, there's a, a doctor named Dr. Semmelweis, and it, I don't remember the, the time frame, but in the was the 16th century or so, he came to see that women who gave birth in a medical facility, which was not a very clean place at the time, they were wildly more likely to get sepsis than ones who were born at home. And he just kind of studied it with a midwife, and he... he conjectured that it had something to do with the doctor going from one woman to the other. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah. Your hands. Right. And so he said, you really need to just wash your hands. I think it will help. And they laughed at him and ridiculed him, and he ended up in an insane asylum. And of course, he had discovered germ theory, and he was right. But because they couldn't see it, mm-hmm. they didn't believe it. And, and this is interesting, too, because you know, doctors poo-poo the autonomic, like that the gut for for many of the last many of the last decades that the mm-hmm. gut was involved in understanding things because they looked at the limbic system and they saw it stopping at the neck and they said it doesn't even connect to the brain of course last summer some um doctors at john hopkins finally found these microscopic veins that continued on from the limbic system to every aspect of the brain and so now they're like mm-hmm. oh i guess there is a connection between the the brain and the rest of the body in the autonomic nervous system. But because they couldn't see it, they said it was bullshit. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes about this kind of hubris of science, the hubris of polling, the hubris of mm-hmm. of experts believing they know everything. Like, and, and we know this in terms of being filmmakers. Uh, we're filmmakers in this room. We are com- constantly subjected to this idea that other people are going to judge what, what you have. And if, if they don't like it, they don't like the data of it. They don't like the format. No one's going to see it because you can't. You have to get it past these gatekeepers all the time. And right. it's the same thing if you're a doctor. If you don't have the, the science, but as, as Dr. Sarno says, how do you measure this and quantify it and qualify it? These things are wildly complex. And so when we deny complexity, and, and that's part of the problem with science. Actually, one of, the re- one of the things that helped us a great deal as we worked on this film was early on when we restarted it was we found an article by Jonah Lehrer called um, Trials and Errors, Why Science is Failing Us. And it details all this, and, and we were really attracted to it because they had this article about the, the data on herniated discs. Mm-hmm. It turns out that they are not a causative factor if you look at the data. If you do a blind study on 300 people, some have pain, some don't, and you give those scans, those MRI scans to like the reader, mm-hmm. they can't tell you who has pain. They'll say, oh my God, that guy, I'm sure that guy can't walk. Totally fine. Because it turns out hmm. that they looked at it and they saw it and they go, that's the problem. But it turns out it wasn't because it doesn't actually correlate. Because people would have beautiful scans. Their backs look wonderful and they're in and they'd be in... debilitating pain. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And people who had crazy looking backs and they, nah, that <laughs> doesn't bother me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's kind of the problem with science and the hubris of it without, you know, it, 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 it wants to say we know the answer, but oftentimes it doesn't. But what's really crazy is they didn't do that study about the MRIs and the herniated discs for many, many years. So they were doing all this surgery on these herniated discs because people coming in with pain, they would find the herniated disc. Mm-hmm. But then what's even crazier is like when we started this movie back in 2004, there was an article that there have been tons of articles about it. So in 2004, there's an article by, I think it was a woman named Gina Collada at the New York times. Mm-hmm. And which said that all this data shows the herniated disc, you know, is not a, a proper diagnosis. Um, and I wrote to her and said, would you be in the film? And she said, absolutely not. I won't talk to any press. You know, I am the press last, like it was six months ago. She published another article. This is now 12 years later saying, I, you know, we, we, we ran this article many, many years ago. 
and nothing has changed. If anything, there's even more surgery. But how is, how is this happening? It was actually kind of a very frustrated article saying, like, well, we, yeah. Because we, yeah. you make some progress, and then um, we did say, then the pharmaceutical companies have a lot invested, I suppose, in, the, in, in your suffering. So, right. you know, yeah, they're that's an all new generation. Pain. Right. Oh. Yeah. Man, I really talked a lot. No, <laughs> well, yes, you what you're supposed to editor. do on a. I think. No, that's what yeah. you're supposed to do on the podcast. Mm. It's the perfect guest wrapped in a uh, conundrum, right? All the rage is, is, is having its North American New York world. <laughs> well, I'm just taking world stands. Premiere. World premiere at yes. Doc NYC 2016 alongside Thomas Leach's uh, The Lure. And uh, Saturday at 7.30. And again on Tuesday at 9.45. Um, Dr. Sarno and his wife will be there, oh, as well as many wasn't. other doctors that are in the movie. Um, John Stossel will be there. Um, but yeah, how'd you get? That? I thought you said, I think I asked you. Yeah, no, he, he wasn't. He, he we're hoping he's going to show up. He's not okay. in the best health, but I hopefully he'll he's show 93, up. 93, 93 years old. So I think that the, the diagnosis for anything wrong when you're that age is you're ninety three. I said and, this, and, t- and you were forced to retire, oh. which makes you upset. Well, uh, press some rage about that maybe. Maybe. All right. <laughs> Can, does he have the capacity to to suppress rage? I suppose anybody does. He does, and uh, you know, he's had. He says in the film that he's, you know, he's had more psychosomatic problems than most of his patients, and you know, but he just understands yeah. what to do in that. But but they keep coming, you know. Mm-hmm. Even though he understands, even though he's the founder of this theory, they these these pains keep coming, these symptoms keep coming, and you just have to keep understanding that the world is complex and your mind is. Doing stuff. I barely scratched the surface. There's so much more one can talk about because it's so so many issues around this are so interconnected. Right. You know, the, from the personal to the political it, it, to the. It is a very personal film, and yeah. that was a really hard balance to find. That's yeah. why it took well, it us gets, seven years to edit. Wow. Well, it's and it gets very personal. You know, at a certain certain point in the yeah. film. Yeah. You know, what we yeah. realized the other day family loss. Mm-hmm. The it, on a personal level, the film has um, four weddings and a funeral. <laughs> It does. Again, crunching numbers here. <laughs> Saturday night world premiere of All the Rage at where is it? IFC. IFC Center. Uh and it sounds like a great screening. What time is it? Seven thirty. Seven thirty? Mm-hmm. Um but it, it is it is wildly sold out. So they did ask mm-hmm. I mean they did add one on Tuesday night at nine forty five. Oh great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Well it's not so fantastic because a lot of people are upset they couldn't get in. Yeah, well, <laughs> It just comes down to watching a good documentary at the end of the day. And you guys will be there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Michael and Suki are in town. Michael was on episode number two of this podcast. <laughs> That's how old I am. And what we, we <laughs> talked about last night is uh, Adam and Suki and I, yeah. we shared a nanny. And Karen. <laughs> and Karen. Yeah. yeah. A nanny when back. <laughs> That's right. We, we <laughs> each paid a well, nanny to watch our children together. Did, is that right? Yeah. They, they, Jacob was she would with come your... over Jacob and pick up oh, Harper. Wow. And Jacob was like, I think, okay. six months older than Harper. Yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. They're very close in age. Yeah. Maybe oh, even a year. Right. And so he would be in the He's stroller. in seventh grade anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, wow. she's in fifth. Jeez. So he was actually two, I guess. And she was, so it was easy for her. She could take the baby yes. and Jacob. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was, we were saying a great, a great, a great nanny, yeah. a great lady. Oh, hell, hell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I miss her. And then uh, our kids ended up being in the same school. Mm-hmm. PS11, and then uh, and then all this craziness with this some, some arena was going on. You know anything about it? Mm. Oh, the arena. Uh, have you seen Battle for Brooklyn? No, I haven't. Oh, you should you should take a look at that, Thomas. Yeah. Trade links. Yeah, yeah. You should. I should definitely do that. And I think you really love the also this not only the lure but the Saul Lighter doc is great. So, oh, and I was like, I was like, uh, uh, and then I watch. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is pretty darn great, actually. Thank you. <laughs> You shouldn't judge so quickly my emails. I know. <laughs> That's well, true. I learned. I learned. It's interesting. We, as we said, we also knew each other because our kids went to this really great school in our neighborhood called PS11. And one day in the hallway, um, it was actually three days after we were back at school from Hurricane Sandy. And mm-hmm. Suki and I were taking Battle for Brooklyn that morning to go to San Francisco. And I just got an iPhone. And this guy stops me in the hall. He goes, oh, are you on Instagram? I was like, oh, no, I just got really? this. And, and I, I've always been a photographer, but I hadn't really been taking pictures for a while. And he's like, uh, he's like, oh, here, let me show you mine. And I was like, those are all the pictures 
from the New Yorker of Hurricane Sandy. Those are the who, what the what the hell? And he's like, yeah. So he would, he was like the very first early adapter to Instagram as a photographer, and his name is Ruddy Roy, and now he has two hundred and seventy thousand followers on Instagram. Um, but that's how if we he met. can harness that and use it for good. But he's very very yeah. influenced by Saul. Oh. Okay. And, uh, so he he's a big uh, proponent, and you, you should actually look at his work. But he um, he's an amazing photographer, an amazing oh. human, and it's this interesting thing that seems so relevant at this moment. How profoundly important it was to go to the local school in the neighborhood mm-hmm. where you meet the people that you live around and become um, have a gain a, gain a much greater understanding of the world outside your island. And I, I think we as parents learned exponentially more than Fiona ever did from our experience at that school. For sure. It forced us into, well, it, it's an interesting thing. I was going to say un, say uncomfortable forced, conversations, yeah. but I, right. I don't know if it is forced because you're grateful for it. Hopefully if you're it a thoughtful person. It made the way person. for a lot of and, really interesting. Yeah. Learning. Well, and also, but having also Reese, uh, right before that being in a, uh, in an interesting building, living in a building, Karen and I had come from Manhattan mm-hmm. where I had sold my place around the corner. I lived right around the corner from here for seven years. And then when I got married, we sold, I sold that place and we moved to an apartment building up on 108th Street on Fifth Avenue. But it was a project at one point and it had been going through the, that slow conversion right. where younger, buying at market value, younger, right. mostly white people had been moving in for the last bunch of years, but they're still the original tenants who were living in East Harlem, you know, who were there. And there was a kind of a, I don't want to say a divide, but there was. Um, But also it forced, it was tense because, you know, there was this threat to the people that could only afford a small amount of money. Mm -hmm. But now these apartments were going for market value. There was, that things were becoming less affordable. Yeah. So it was an interesting thing where you had to kind of talk to your neighbors and recognize that this was a reality right. that was a greater force than your own and this was, but it was an opportunity. this was all going on as we were shooting and making battle for brooklyn which right. informed that whole process yeah you know? mm. so it spoke to to me mm-hmm. i know that was an appeal mm-hmm. not only sharing a nanny but <laughs> thank you guys thank you adam